Whenever the subject of genital mutilation is raised with the followers of Muhammad of any nationality or culture, they almost invariably tell us that these were the traditions of the people even before Islam. Even some anthropologists subscribe to such a statement. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. They give us this particular excuse so as to deflect our shock and disgust as such an inhumane and savage act. To be fair, let us together look at the historical records from all over the world to find out if the Mohammedan claims may be true. In the annals of the Babylonians, Assyrians, Hebrews, Egyptians, Persians, Indians, Chinese, Greeks, Romans, other Europeans, etc., not once is there mention of female genital mutilation as a tradition or even as a policy. Most important of all, there is not a single instance of a painted or carved scene in the daily life and ritual of antiquity, posited on vases, temples, tombs, or walls of the ancient civilizations of Sumeria, Crete, Etrusca, India, or any other, showing female genital mutilation, while they depicted in vivid detail sexual copulations and erotic scenes without any inhibition nor are such practices mentioned in the Bible or by any of the ancient historians, such as Herodotus, Tacitus, Strabo, or any others who may have either witnessed or were told of such practices. All the available evidence suggests that female genital mutilation is a relatively recent practice. In fact, on the contrary, primitive tribes used to adorn their genitals with ivory bones, copper rings, tattoos, and elaborate scars, believing that these adornments would attract the opposite sex, never mutilation. Male circumcision involves the cutting off the prepus of the penis, which does not interfere with the male's pleasure of the sexual act and is invariably a simple non-intrusive surgical operation. Female genital mutilation, on the other hand, cuts away the tissue containing the nerve endings that contribute to the woman's pleasure. In some cases, only the labia minora are amputated. In others, the labia majora, as well as the clitoris, are removed. In extreme cases, all the external tissue, rich in sexual arousal nerve endings, is excised and the vagina sutured closed to open forcefully on the hapless female's wedding night. For such females, Sexual advances are unwanted, and the act itself becomes a kind of rape. Many females thus afflicted are psychologically and physically scarred for life, if they survive such a drastic and unhygienic operation. Ladies and gentlemen, please be aware that the human brain is the most powerful sexual organ. All the senses are capable of arousing one. The process of awakening the brain by sexual stimuli has been refined by nature by providing adequate levels of estrogen or testosterone hormones over millions of years to secure the continuation of the species. In male castration, the testicles are removed, thereby eliminating most of the male brain's response to sexual stimuli. In female genital mutilation, the estrogen-producing ovaries are unaffected. Hence, the female's brain continues to be aroused by thoughts of sexual pleasure that cannot physically be fulfilled. The result of female genital mutilation is far more cruel and devastating than castration. Today, female genital mutilation is practiced predominantly in Islamic countries. Pakistan, Middle East, Egypt, among sub-Saharan African tribes, etc., it is virtually non-existent in countries of other major religions or of pagan or animistic religions. Prior to the Arabs introducing Muhammad's version of Islam, female genital mutilation and male castration were not institutionalized practices anywhere in the world. Male Muhammadan Muslims are obsessed with virginity. Based on the Hadith and Muhammad Sunnah, they consider women as the source of unbridled sexual desires that must be both covered and controlled. Since it is a fact 
that the Quran and Hadith were composed, compiled, and spread by literate males without the input of a single female, the bias against females in both cases is institutionalized, gratuitous, and endemic gender racism. They instituted the idiosyncratic practice of veiling their women as if each and every one of them is a genital, an unknown practice to non-literate cultures, adding injury to insult. Male Muhammadan Muslims condone female genital mutilation in order to control the sexuality of their females also. In either case, the practice is a method of domination, control, subjugation, and humiliation. As we have demonstrated in our earlier chapters, the females of the human species are treated by Muhammadan Islam as one little step higher than domestic animals. When Muhammadan Islam became the dominant power in the Arab Empire, womanhood reached a nadir when the religious leaders stopped their women from even going out to shop. As ridiculous as this may sound, this is exactly the case in 21st century Arabia for a start. Needing someone to do the job of shopping and having an unlimited supply of slaves, a new widespread policy was instituted to castrate as many slaves as needed to do the household errands as well as keep an eye on the harem. Thus began the proliferation of eunuchs in the Islamic empire as substitutes for the female shoppers to provide Arab homes with the staples of day-to-day -day living. The greatest tragedy in the 21st century is the fact that Muslim women in the Western democracies who are protected by law are aiding and abetting their male partners in allowing themselves to be subjugated, debased, and humiliated. Another repulsive manifestation is the total lack of support by Western feminists who are much more brave in burning their bras but not in demonstrating for the liberation of 750 million oppressed females. Believers and unbelieving kuffar, mark my words, slowly but most assuredly, the public in Europe and the USA is becoming much more aware of the insidious nature of Muhammadan Islam in our democracies than our mostly spineless or criminally negligent leaders. The people will elect politicians who will stop immigration from Muhammadan countries and will introduce laws that will allow immigrants to become citizens only if they abide by the law of the land and be loyal to the state and people they live amongst. In summation, it is without a shadow of a doubt that the depraved act of female genital mutilation was and is institutionalized by the Arabs and Islam to serve their needs and did not exist prior to Muhammadan Islam.